reverse it back the other way. Back in July 1940, the pilots of Fighter Command were discovering just how limited their training had been. Nobody had prepared them for the shock of meeting the enemy for real. When I looked over my right, I saw some aeroplanes with swastikas on them, or crosses they were from that position, flying below there. And uh, I called up and I said, uh, oh, I can see some aircraft down there with crosses on. <laughs> and uh, my leader said, that's a bloody enemy, you fool. <laughs> I just saw these yellow-nosed aircraft going past me, and I was actually, believe it or not, admiring them. They looked so pretty, and I suddenly realised that that was the enemy. So I started firing at them. By that time, someone had got onto my tail, and that was the end of my first um, encounter. They shot me down. The yellow-nosed Messerschmitt 109 was the mainstay of the Luftwaffe fighter force and a formidable opponent. It was nice to see it below you when it hadn't spotted you, but it was nasty to see it behind you. That was quite, uh, quite unnerving. Although a fine aircraft, the 109 was much harder to fly than the Hurricane or Spitfire, a real disadvantage in the rush to get novices up into the air. When I was at Duxford and saw some German pilots, I said, do you know why the, the Spitfire was a better aeroplane than the Messerschmitt 109, and they said no. And I said, any idiot could fly a Spitfire, but it took a lot of training to fly a 109. Unfortunately for the RAF, German pilots were among the best in the world, many of them battle-hardened. On the English side, there were good pilots, but they had no experience of war. On our side, of course, we had men who had been in combat. They had flown in Spain, or like me, in the war against Poland. For most in fighter command, this would be their first experience of fighting at all. One of the most vivid accounts of what it is like was written by a young pilot called Richard Hillary. The book he wrote, The Last Enemy, became a classic, and he was later to record it for radio. On the day after my arrival, I had my first taste of them. As we got the order to take off, and I climbed hurriedly into the cockpit of my machine, I felt an empty sensation of suspense in the pit of my stomach. For one second, time seemed to stand still, and I stared blankly in front of me, for I knew that that morning I was to kill for the first time. And we were off. For RAF squadrons comprising of a dozen planes, the first shock was coming up against formations of German aircraft numbering in the hundreds. The result was chaos and confusion, requiring lightning quick reflexes. It was a melee, it wasn't a dogfight. Dogfighting ceased in the First World War as the airplanes got fast. Airplanes came all directions, all over the place. So you spend most of your time trying to avoid running into someone. The one and nine of flash passion. And to keep him in your sights, to have a chance of shooting him down. Two seconds was too long. You may turn and fire your gun. It wouldn't be one continuous burst, it would just be... Brrr. It couldn't really do much more than have a squirt. <laughs> Bullets were flying everywhere. Most fights they were all over in minutes, question of minutes, and then, as I say, everything was empty. So you just said, thank Christ for that, and went home. <laughs> You, you can have bullet holes when you get back and you can say, oh, good God, where did those come from? In fact, I picked up a, a spent bullet from the bottom of the cockpit once and no idea where it came from. We hear a lot in modern wars about friendly fire and it was rife during the Battle of Britain. My examination of the records suggests that there were no less than 36 British aircraft shot down by their own side. I'm quite sure it was another Spitfire that um, did me in because I saw this other aircraft and I turned to, to display my wing plan, which is the obvious one, because the 109s had straight-edged wings cut off at the tip. The Spitfire had this elliptical wing, so that was an instant recognition for him, so I let him see it. But um, that was too late and he'd shot off his bolt and it hit me in the pit of the tank. 
When you think of the speed at which events are occurring, if you think of the confusion of a dogfight, if you think that all you've probably got to go on is a glimpse of a silhouette, what are you going to do? Are you going to open fire or are you not going to open fire? Well, quite a lot of the time they open fire, a lot of the time they actually hit them. The only thing to be done is get out of the RPQ as quickly as possible. The flames were coming out and sort of burning off my uniform and a bit of me in the process. And the next thing I knew, I was floating down through the air without an aircraft. Other pilots were luckier. On their very first sorties, they found themselves shooting down enemy planes as if by accident. We were flying along in formation and I saw a lot of black specks which I thought was oil on the windscreen. They turned out to be 109s coming in the opposite direction. And uh, one of them passed over my head by about 20 feet or so. You could see the oil streaks, I vividly remember, under his engine and almost count the rivets. I fired at him and to my great surprise he caught fire. And uh, I was a bit horrified. Gosh, how did I do that? So on my first sortie, I shot down two aircraft without knowing what was happening in the sky about me, why it was happening, or who was doing what to whom. I should have been shot down and killed myself. We ran into them at 18,000 feet. 20 yellow-nosed Messerschmitt 109s, about 100 feet above us. And as they came down on us, we went into line astern and turned head on to them. I kicked the rudder to the left to get him at right angles, turned the gun button to fire, and let go in a four-second burst with full deflection. He came right through my sights, and I saw the tracer from all eight guns thud home. For a second, he seemed to hang motionless. A jet of red flame shot upwards, and he spun into the ground. It had happened. I realized then that I had felt neither pity nor sorrow for that man. If I were to die, I asked nothing better than to go the same way. The controls of the Spitfire are very simple, especially compared to a modern aircraft. The first thing we come to is the control column. And the top of this control column is a lovely spade stick. And we use this to roll the aircraft to the right, using our ailerons. And then to pitch the aircraft nose down to dive, we push forward, which uses our elevators at the rear of the aircraft. However, if we were to use the controls this roughly and fly, we wouldn't be in for a nice time. Generally, it's just very gentle like that, and nose up. And then to left, it's almost, you've got to think to go left, and then just a tiniest little bit of that will gently bring us round to the left, and again to the right. It's very, very gentle. We have our altimeter, which shows us our altitude, and we have our airspeed indicator, which on this aircraft runs around twice to 350 knots. We also have, for the fighter pilot, we have the guns, which you press there, or the cannons, if the, the pilot was in a position where he definitely needed the kill and he was very sure he was going to get the kill, he'd be able to unload both. Most Spitfires didn't get cannons until after the Battle of Britain. In 1940, they were equipped with eight machine guns, four in each wing. This was potent firepower, except for the fact that few pilots were ever actually trained in how to really use them. We were given 20 rounds per gun each and told to go to the farther in the North Sea. Well, you couldn't really miss the North Sea. And uh, that's the only gunnery we did. A skilled pilot, who is also a marksman, is thinking entirely about how he's going to control this machine as part of himself, as if he's swinging a shotgun in the sky. Um, and instead of tracking an aircraft by moving the gun around, he's actually using the controls to do the same thing, because essentially what he is doing is using it to point in the direction he needs to get the right shot to deliver some deadly blows. You've got to aim your guns you're, um, ahead of the enemy. 